Kelly Roper, um, and I am a member of our St. Mo's in-house preaching team, so it's good to be with all of you this morning. A little bit about me, I live just a couple blocks away on St. Paul Street. Um, I've been a member here at St. Mo's for about five years, and I work in college ministry at Johns Hopkins. If this is your first time here, uh, welcome. We are very glad you are here. Um, before we dive in, let me just open us in a word of prayer. Got it, feels silly to say we invite you into this space because we know uh, that you're already here and you've you've already been here long before uh, we arrived. But God, um, I pray that you would help us to feel your presence with us today. Um, God, would um, we be able to receive uh, exactly what each of us needs from you. And God, may the words of my mouth and the meditation of our hearts be acceptable in your sight, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. The other week I was on a walk with a friend and we were catching up on life and work and my friend started telling a story of something that had happened for that week. And something that she said in her story triggered in my mind a reminder that I needed to get a birthday gift for my mom. Um, so my friend is continuing to talk and tell the story that she's telling but my mind starts to wander and I'm thinking, okay, what am I gonna get her? And probably need to order it by this day so it gets there in time and so on. Um, but all the while I'm giving these verbal cues, like verbal affirmation that makes it sound like I'm listening, like, mm, mm mm-hmm, yeah. But I'm like totally checked out, like on another planet. And so at some point my friend gets to the end end of her story and she goes, yeah, I mean, what about you? And my mind snaps back to attention and I realize, oh no, I have no idea what she just said. Um, There are two options open to me at that point. The first is to say something vague that will rescue me, like, yeah, totally hear that. (laughs) Uh, The other is to fess up and say, oh gosh, I'm so sorry. I was like totally checked out. Can you say that one more time? I promise I'm listening this time. Maybe you've been on the other end of this where you've been talking to someone and at some point you realize, yeah, they are not listening to me. And maybe what's happening for them in that moment is they're more concerned about what they're gonna say in response to you or they got distracted. We've all been there. A brilliant example of this is from the show Peanuts, you know, Charlie Brown. And do you remember the adults in Peanuts? Do you ever see the adults? No, but do you hear them? Yes, and what do they sound like? Does anyone remember? Wah, 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 wah. Yes, amazing. Okay, we need to watch a clip to refresh our memory. Well, there it is, Sally. See, nothing to be frightened about. Ah! Absolutely right. We should have been studying. But you, may I say something, ma'am? You seem to forget that you haven't given us any assignments yet. Now you've done it, here comes a stupid assignment. Miss Hofferson, could you repeat our assignment? Write a 500 word theme on what we did this summer? How do you teachers keep coming up with these great new ideas? I have no idea how they make that sound, but it sounds like some sort of instrument being covered by like someone's hand or saran wrap or something, but it's awesome, so memorable. Now, what are they getting at? Well, there's the world of adults, and then there's the world of kids, and never the two shall meet. It's like a different language. The parents are talking, but it's just like wah, wah, wah. Some of the parents or maybe some of the spouses in the room are like, yep, I'm pretty sure that's what they hear when I talk. (laughs) Um, There's this communication breakdown. And you're listening, you hear sounds, but you're not tracking. It's just noise, it's just background noise. I'm convinced that what the creators of Peanuts are putting their finger on, and this is something that is widespread in communities that follow Jesus. It happens for a lot of different reasons, but the stories of Jesus and his teachings, they can become very familiar to us over time. And I would say particularly for those of us that grew up in the church or who have been in Christian spaces for a while, we run the risk of the powerful teachings of Jesus just becoming background noise. I think this can be especially true with some of the parables of Jesus. So around, we're listening, we're hearing, but really what we're hearing is just wah, wah, wah. 
This morning we're starting our summer series called Parables of the Kingdom, looking at some of the most well-loved parables of Jesus. Parables are short, fictitious stories that Jesus tells in the gospel accounts. Um, now parables aren't unique to Jesus. We see them other places in scripture and told by some of his contemporaries, but they were a big part of his ministry. This month is gonna be like parable season one um, from our in-house preaching team. We'll be on hiatus in July, have some one-off sermons from some guest preachers and then come back for parable season two in August. Um, so as we bring, begin this series in parables of the kingdom, um, there might be some of us in the room for whom some of these stories are very familiar. And we might find ourselves periodically saying, oh my gosh, I've heard a billion sermons on this one. Um, but if that's you, my invitation is to let these stories become strange to you again, um, to look at them with fresh eyes with the expectation that God might have something new for us. Can we do that? Is that cool? Sweet. Let's do it. Well, today we are camping out in Mark chapter 4, which some of you might know as the parable of the sower. There's actually a couple different parables in this chapter, but the one we're looking at today is called the parable of the sower. And today we're jumping right into the middle of the story. A quick recap, at the beginning of the book of Mark, Jesus begins his public ministry and he begins healing people and casting out impure spirits and teaching and preaching and forgiving people of their sins, all of this awesome stuff. And we are going to pick up starting in Mark chapter 4, uh, verse 1. We read, again, Jesus began to teach by the lake, classic Jesus, Jesus loved to teach by the lake. And there are these, uh, the crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it on the lake while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. Jesus has been on the road teaching for a little while now, and there are these large crowds that have come from all over. They've come from all over to hear Jesus teach. This is a clever way of creating a little amphitheater, um, ancient world, no sound, sound system, no microphones. So Jesus gets in a boat, pushes off a little ways from the shore and his voice would have been carried by or amplified by the water. And he begins teaching. Um, now let's pause right here and do a quick check-in about what we know about Jesus so far. Um, you don't have to answer this out loud, but I'm gonna give us 10 seconds to think about it on our own. If you were on the shore that day or had heard Jesus teaching on any other day, what would you guess you would hear Jesus talking about on an average day? Like if you had to summarize all the teaching, all the preaching, all the messages of Jesus in just one sentence, what would you say? Take 10 seconds to think about that. Some of us might be thinking, I actually have no idea. Um, others maybe thought of love, you know, love God, love neighbor, golden rule, do unto others as you would want them to do unto you, something like that. Maybe the concept of eternal life, we do see Jesus talk about that. But when we see what Jesus talks about more than any other thing, there is one main center. You read any of the gospels and you just highlight it every time it shows up, it just leaps off the page. If you turn back with me to Mark chapter one, after Jesus is baptized, he begins his public ministry and goes around Galilee preaching, the kingdom of God has come near, repent and believe in the good news. Then he forms a little group of followers and they go around preaching the good news about this kingdom, the kingdom of God. Other places, the gospel writers say kingdom of heaven, it's the same thing, they're synonyms, just different ways of phrasing it. Any given day you hear Jesus teaching, that is what he is talking about. This is Jesus' main message. Okay, great, the kingdom of God is here. What on earth does that mean? <laughs> One of the reasons I'm so pumped that we're in the series on the parables is because every parable is Jesus unpacking what it means that the kingdom of God is here. The Bible as a whole tells the story of this kingdom. God is a creator king who creates a good world and creates humans in his image to rule over it. And God intends to live in loving community with the humans. But there's a problem because this lasts only about a page and a half. The humans rebel against God, insisting on ruling the world for ourselves. And that rebellion causes violence, destruction, broken relationships, broken systems, basically a world that looks a lot like ours. We've seen evidence of this time and time and time again this year. Um, but the biblical story holds out hope that God has not abandoned his creation. God launches a rescue mission centered on the person of his son, Jesus. And the goal of this rescue mission is to restore his rightful reign to the world. And this rest restoration would bring about peace, healing, hope, right relationship between God, humans, and the earth. Um, now, it's important for us to notice that the message of Jesus is not 
repent and just hold on because one day we're going to get out of here and go to the kingdom of heaven. No, that's not what he says. He says the kingdom of God is where? The kingdom of God is where? It's near. It's here. Now. What Jesus is saying is like so much cooler. When Jesus shows up on the scene, we begin to see this inbreaking, this invading of the kingdom of God here on earth. And one day the kingdom of God will be here in its fullness, but we're not there yet. Remember when we pray the Lord's Prayer each week, we pray God's kingdom come, his will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Jesus says, hey guys, the long awaited day of God bringing about new creation, it doesn't start in some disembodied existence after we die, it begins here, now in me and what I'm doing. In Jesus' life and later in the storyline, culminating in his death and resurrection. And so the message of the good news, the message of the gospel is that the kingdom of God is near because Jesus, the king, is here. And this is good news, amen? All right, so Jesus is going around, sharing the story, announcing his kingdom. How are people responding? If we look at Mark chapter 3, which uh, comes right before this, every story in Mark chapter 3 is about someone responding to Jesus. You get some people who are like totally fans of Jesus, think he's a traveling production of, I don't know, Hamilton or some show that people are flocking from all over to see. <laughs> some are scared to death of him, others are indifferent. And then when we look at the Pharisees, the religious leaders, they are plotting about how to kill him because he's calling them out on their corruption. So Jesus stands in front of this very, very mixed crowd and he tells a little story. Here's the story that he tells. He says, listen, one day a farmer went out to sow a seed, and as he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some seed fell on rocky places where it just didn't have much soil, and it sprang up quickly because the soil was shallow, but then the sun came, and the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants so they could not bear grain. But some seed, some seed fell on good soil, and that seed grew up and produced a crop, some multiplying 30, some 60, some 100 times. Whoever is used to hear, let them hear. Mic drop. Now, imagine uh, you're standing in the crowd, you're thinking, uh, am I in the right place? <laughs> I just heard a little lecture on birds, seeds, farmers. What's going on here? Some people hear the parable and it's just like wah, wah, wah. But some people hear it and go, okay, I think there's something to this. So what is Jesus saying? Do people get it? Do his closest followers get it? Let's keep reading. We read, when he was alone, the 12 and the others, so there's other disciples beyond just the 12 that have been following Jesus around, the 12 and the other disciples came and asked him about the parables. This is like office hours with Jesus, okay? The disciples come to him and are like, what are you doing, Jesus? Why are you speaking to the people in parables? I imagine them wanting to give him uh, some constructive feedback, like, Jesus, dude, we love you. You are an awesome teacher, but I think you need to rework this sermon because people are just like more confused. After all, you're the Messiah. Why don't you just, you know, be more clear and give it to them straight? They have a good point. What's Jesus up to? Well, he responds and he says, nope. That was actually intentional. Jesus told them the secret, the secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside, Everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding, otherwise they might turn and be forgiven. Hmm. Jesus is basically saying, nope, that was actually intentional. I am intentionally being unclear and indirect. Let's take a brief step out of the storyline and just ask ourselves for a minute, what does it raise in us? What does it raise in you 
to hear Jesus say that his parables are intentionally unclear and indirect. What's like your gut level feeling response to that? And what questions does it raise for you? Take 10 seconds on your own to think about that. I don't know about you, but for me, it raises the question, is Jesus being exclusive here? Like, why is this such a big secret? Why is he being so secretive? Who are those on the outside and why are they excluded from getting the explanation? And like, does this mean Jesus doesn't want people to be forgiven? Well, I mean, let's think about it for a second. Remember, who's in the crowds? It's a bunch of people that want to kill him a bunch of people who are indifferent to him or doubt him. Some think he's interesting, kind of fun to be around, but I don't know, whatever. Some think he's crazy. And imagine if Jesus is just like super direct, they're gonna dig their heels in even more. What Jesus says here, whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. He does it to indicate the cookies are not on the bottom shelf, so to speak. The meaning of what he said isn't on the surface. You have to dig for it, you have to work for it. If you're lazy and you don't care, it's it's not gonna make any sense to you. But if you have your spiritual antennae up, you're gonna be drawn in and say, okay, I think I see what's going on here. So instead of spoon feeding them the answer, he puts the ball in their court and invites people to come work it out, to work out their questions in the context of a relationship with him. And so for us, this begs the question, when we are faced with big questions and doubts about God, the goodness of God, what's happening in the world, what's in the Bible and why, what will we do? Will we, like the disciples do, take those questions to Jesus, lean into him and keep asking? Or will we say, no, it's it's just too hard and distance ourselves and walk away? Jesus' parables have a dual function to those whose hearts are open, they will draw them in and make them ask questions. But to those whose hearts are hard, they will reinforce their hardness of heart, Um, which is what he says. He says, this is why I speak to them in parables. It's fulfilling what the prophet Isaiah said in Isaiah six, they're here to see me, but they don't see me. They're here to hear me, but they don't hear me. Wah, wah, wah. And why? I mean, what is it that makes someone unable to hear what someone else is saying? Like, what's going on in me when I'm not hearing my friend? I come with my own agenda. I come with what I think I already know or want to say in response, or I'm distracted by the things and not being present to the conversation, um, which is what Jesus here calls hardness of heart. Their hearts are calloused and they can't hear. Jesus says, if they did see and did hear, they would turn and I would heal. When he sees people rejecting him, he's, he's not gonna force it. He's simply gonna respond in a way that keeps the ball in their court. Um, but they are gonna miss out on participating in this upside down, unexpected kingdom that Jesus is bringing. Um, but to people that are open, he is right there drawing them in, giving them more insight and understanding. This is sort of like if my friend picks up that I'm not listening and they throw in a crazy sentence like, yeah, I wanna go to Mars tomorrow and I keep nodding. I'm like, yeah, sounds good. (laughs) Like the game is up, I'm caught. But how do they know if I'm listening? If I go, wait, what? Oh, yep, you got me, I'm sorry. I was not listening. Jesus says, that's what the parables are doing. Jesus expected that many people would not listen to him. And he's not gonna force it. He's gonna allow people to respond in, uh, in whatever way they're gonna respond. Um, let's zoom out for a second to, uh, to 30,000 feet. How does this help us to understand what Jesus is doing with the parables or even really reframe how we read them? Some of us might have typically thought of parables at our, as like little illustrations that Jesus uses to make something more clear But Jesus seems to have a slightly different idea of what he's doing here, at least with some of his parables. Um, Let's read what one scholar, Clyde Snodgrass, has to say about the parables. 
He says, direct communication is important for conveying information, but learning is more than just information intake. If you're a teacher in the room, you know this. Simply memorizing facts or just banking information is not the same as really like understanding and grasping concepts. Especially if the learner is someone who already thinks they understand. People entrenched in their current understanding set their defenses against direct communication and end up conforming the message into the channels of their current understanding of reality. Oh my gosh, how many times in the last year have you been in an argument with someone and you're just going at it, going at it, both of you are digging your heels in and everything the other person is saying is just convincing you more and more that you're right, right? That's what's happening here and Jesus is not playing that game. But Indirect communication finds a way in through a back window to confront a person's view of reality. And a parable's ultimate aim is to draw the listener in to awaken insight, to stimulate the conscience, and to move to action. Jesus' parables are prophetic instruments used to get God's people to stop, reconsider their way of viewing reality, and change their behavior. And so the cryptic, indirect, and like kind of confusing nature of Jesus' parables, as one scholar, Tim Mackey, puts it, it's a feature and not a bug. Jesus' parables are not simply these cute, clever illustrations that he uses to teach moral, ethical lessons. Um, they're also not his way of teaching systematic theology through story. They are a tool that Jesus uses to show how he is bringing the kingdom of God, one that is meant to stir up curiosity and create almost like a mini faith crisis of sorts, and they demand a response. And so here's what we're gonna do. We are going to finish reading through the explanation of the four soils, um, and Jesus is gonna give us an opportunity to respond to him. We all come here in different places. Our ears might be wide open. Maybe you know that God is up to something in your life and you're just trying to, um, to lean into him to know what that is. You might be so bored with the whole religious thing that you're on the verge of everything Jesus says. It's just like wah, wah, wah. And Jesus has us pegged. He knows this about us. And so every one of us fits into one of the descriptions of these four soils. And he's gonna call us out here as we read them. So let's dive in. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like seeds sown along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. So the seed sown along the path, it's hard packed ground. Uh, The seed can't get into the dirt at all and is just laying on the surface and then the birds come and take it away. This is someone who hears the message of the kingdom and it confronts them in their brokenness uh, and dysfunction and says, hey, you need to be rescued and you need grace. And to someone who has an impenetrable heart, they're like, "Mm, nah, I'm good. I'm just fine the way I am, don't need to be rescued. And Jesus says something even more haunting here with the image of the birds. He says, hey, if, if the message of the kingdom is the only source of hope and rescue that we have, rescue in Jesus, and you reject that, your heart is hard and you are opening yourself up to forces that are at work in our world, deep, dark, mysterious forces that are at work to destroy what's good in God's world. And you open yourself up to that when your heart is hard because you don't absorb the very thing that can like save you and help you. Um, Now, one important clarification, who in the storyline so far is this soil, like totally rejected Jesus and wants to kill him? Pharisees, yeah, the most religious people in their culture. So this is not a matter of like being a Christian or not a Christian. (laughs) The most religious upstanding people in their community are the ones with hard hearts who are having seeds stolen by dark powers, what uh, the apostle Paul would probably call the powers and principalities. Okay, next soil, soil two. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. Yes, totally down for Jesus, followed him on Instagram and TikTok, watched some of his Instagram lives, done. But since they have no root that lasts only a short time, when trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Man, I feel like this is what we just spent like six weeks talking about in our anti-fragile faith series, right? Like, do we have the kind of faith that has deep roots that can weather the difficulties of living in an environment um, that is broken and sometimes hostile to Jesus and the values of the kingdom? When the values of the kingdom come into conflict with the values of the different spaces that you're in, what are you gonna do? 
It's shallow. There's no real commitment there. It won't last. So well, three. Still others, like sea and stone among, among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desire, desires for other things come in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. The thorny soil hears the word, they get it, they are like down for it. The only problem is that the good news of Jesus isn't the only thing growing in their life. There's other stuff growing there too, weeds and thorns. And the problem with weeds and thorns is that they take up all the soil, water, light, energy, and leave no room for anything else. And Jesus names two things in particular here, anxiety and greed, ambition for accumulating material wealth. But he gives lists of other thorny things elsewhere, bitterness, unforgiveness, emotional dysfunction, junk. He says, you can't expect the good news of the kingdom to bear fruit in your life if you've got all these other things taking root. You gotta deal with it, so do something about it. Start pulling weeds. Last soil, soil four. Others, like seeds sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some 30, some 60, some 100 times what was sown. This person hears it, gets it, and it transforms them. And how do you know? How do you know someone is good soil? Well, Jesus gives one criteria here. He says, you ask, what is their life producing? Look at their life. Don't look at what they say they're about, what they say their theology is. Look at how they live. Look at their day-to-day -day choices. What are they doing with their life? How do they make decisions? How do they treat people? That will tell you. The Apostle Paul calls this the fruit of the Spirit in Galatians 5. He says, but the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A good barometer is just to ask the question, do I have more of that stuff growing in my life than I did a year ago? Which is just very practical, right? Like, what is your life growing? If it's growing the opposite of all these things, Jesus is like getting on our face a little bit here. He's saying, hey, are you actually listening? As we head into musical worship, we're gonna have um, an opportunity to respond together as a community. Uh, for those that walked in the building, you should have received a little envelope uh, when you walked in that says secret, do not open. Since we are talking about the secret of the kingdom of God today, you can go ahead and open that. Um, and inside you will find two pieces of paper. The first is a piece of paper that looks like this. You got these little paper seats. Um, around the room, we're gonna have these different stations set up that are representative of each of the four soils. Um, we're gonna invite Mark Newman to come up and uh, play some reflection music for us and lead us in a worship song. Um, and as we do that, um, you're gonna have space to reflect. What soil are you right now? Where is your heart right now? Um, and when you're ready, you can come up and put your little paper seeds on the poster with the soil that you would say is most reflective of where you are. Um, just let's try to be spatially aware. So if you notice that there's a lot of people around the poster that you wanna put your seeds on, um, maybe wait a minute before, uh, while there are um, fewer people around the, po the poster. Um, and as we do this, let's, um, as a community, pray and ask God, God, help make us into good soil that we might be good soil to receive um, what God might want to grow in us in this series, in the parables, and uh, for the rest of our lives. People on Zoom, don't worry, you guys are not left out. You get to do this too, just in modified form, which I think uh, John Rain is uh, going to explain and post a link in, in the chat um, for you guys. Um, so let me just pray for us as we transition into this time. God, thank you for um, this parable, which, uh, yeah, feels like weird and kind of confusing. Um, but God, we're grateful that you are God that uh, doesn't just want to have the kind of relationship where we can just uh, consume and listen to what you say and walk away. But um, the way that you teach and what you invite us into is ongoing dialogue and conversation and wrestling. So God, as we enter this time together, um, would you convict us in the ways that we need to be convicted? Um, and God, thank you that we are not just stuck in whatever soil we feel like we are right now. Um, 
God, we want to be a good soil. And so would you help us to do the hard work of uprooting the weeds and uprooting the rocks and tilling the soil um, so that we would be able to receive um, what you have for us. Amen.